Uh, turn with me, please, in your Bibles uh, to the prophecy of Isaiah once again. And we're going to read from Isaiah chapter 61. And unlike the previous two weeks, which were all over 20 verses long, this is a shorter portion, just 11 verses. So we'll take the time and we'll read the entire chapter as well as a portion in the New Testament that relates to it. So first of all, Isaiah 61, and we begin reading in verse 1, where it says this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old ways. They shall raise up the former desolations. And they shall repair the waste cities and desolations of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. And the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. And in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. For your shame you shall have double, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. For I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering, and I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them, and they uh, are the seed, that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. I'll greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh her, himself with ornaments. And as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. And then, please, a very familiar passage to you in, in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 4. And if you have a ribbon uh, in your Bible, I'd like you to keep it in Luke 4, because we'll be going back and forth between Isaiah 61 and Luke chapter 4 quite a bit this morning. But in Luke uh, 4, verse 16, we read these words. It says, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Again, God will bless the reading of his precious word uh, to us uh, this morning. And so as we consider together this uh, passage of scripture, uh, we are going to title it Earth Jubilee. And of course, it's going to be based on a passage in Leviticus chapter 25, where uh, every 50th year, 
Uh, there was a jubilee year where the captives were set free and where there was a restoration of land to those that had lost it through poverty or whatever. And it was a, it was a year of jubilee. And in a very real sense, I believe that that's the background of this particular chapter. It's, it's the, the year of the earth's jubilee where the captives are going to be set free, uh, where there's going to be a restoration of that which is lost where great blessing is going to come. Now, last week, uh, those of you that were with us, we, we looked at uh, the glory days, if you like, of Israel's history. We looked at the millennial kingdom. Uh, we looked at the day when Israel will be the light to the nations, uh, when the glory of uh, God will return to Israel and will shine upon them, uh, when the, the wealth of the nations will flow into uh, the land of Israel, uh, when the Gentiles will show respect to Israel like they've never shown before. They'll, they'll acknowledge them to be the people of God and where righteousness will come to the land of Israel. And so we, we what, saw those things and we found them very fascinating. But this chapter explains how it's going to come about. It's through the work of God's perfect servant that these things are going to come to the nation of Israel. And so this is one of the servant songs in Isaiah's prophecy. We're very familiar with some of them, I'm sure. Uh, we're familiar with Isaiah 53. That's one of the servant songs uh, that are found in this uh, glorious book of Isaiah. Well, this is the fifth and final one. And it's an amazing servant song uh, describing God's perfect servant, and so it describes him, and really basically what it's saying is all the glory and all the blessing that will one day come to Israel is going to come through the work of this one who God has sent through none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it refers to the coming of Israel's Messiah, and in a sense it, it re refers to his two comings. There's his coming in grace that's described so eloquently. In uh, verses 1 and 2, the first part of verse 2, where it talks about to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And so at his first advent, healing the brokenhearted, good tidings to the meek, all these amazing things occurred at his first advent. And that's why the Lord Jesus said, this day, these things are fulfilled in your hearing. And then it says he closed the book. He stopped right there. He didn't go any further. Because the next portion, if he'd have kept reading, would, would have said, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Well, that day of vengeance is yet to come. That will come when he comes in glory at his second advent. He came in grace at his first advent. He's coming in glory at his second advent. And he will come and wreak vengeance on all those uh, that have opposed his rule on the earth. And so basically, this chapter outlines some of those glorious truths. And so as we look at it, uh, we notice it begins with this way. It says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. And so <clears throat> speaking of the, the, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And if you recall, at the baptism of the Lord Jesus, it tells us a spirit, the spirit descended upon him like a dove. And so that speaks of his anointing. By the way, the, the word anointing or the anointed one is a reference to the Messiah. He would be God's anointed prophet, priest, and king in one person. And here, the spirit coming on the Lord Jesus at his baptism to set him apart as God's anointed one. And so here he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me. He He's made me the Messiah. He's made me that anointed one, that promised one, God's prophet, priest, and king. And it's interesting how it was a dove that alighted upon him. If you remember back to the days of Noah, and this is very much in my mind because just this week I went to see the Ark Encounter in Kentucky and I was in a full-scale model of Noah's Ark. And it was, it was phenomenal, great experience. But of course, at that Ark Encounter, of course, it tells the story. But of course, remember the Ark was... Uh, from the ark, the dove was sent out, and it could find no clean place to light upon, and so it returned to the ark. And then we don't hear about it again. And here's an interesting story. 
because where did the dove alight? Where did it find a clean place in this cursed world to alight upon? Well, the Lord Jesus was that clean place. And again, what a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit, like a dove, resting upon the Lord Jesus. Notice, too, uh, it, it's a beautiful picture of the Trinity in the Old Testament. We believe that God eternally existed in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, three distinct persons who have worked together constantly in harmony to accomplish purposes on this earth. And so we see the three persons very distinctly in this scripture, as in other places in Isaiah. We've got the spirit of the Lord. God is upon me, speaking again of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, that blessed person. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to <clears throat> preach good tidings to the meek. He hath sent me. And so that's the Lord Jehovah has anointed me. He has sent me. And so, again, we, we would suggest that's God the Father who has sent the Lord Jesus. And he is the sent one, uh, the one who the Father sent into the world uh, to redeem lost humanity. And so we've got the Father, we've got the Holy Spirit, and, of course, the me who has been anointed is none other than the Lord Jesus. And we know that from our portion in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4 where he refers it to himself. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he says, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And so we, we see this glorious age that is about to come on planet earth. It's a result of the work of the triune God, God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit, working together in perfect harmony to restore a fallen world to pristine glory in the millennial kingdom. And we said it's not the only place uh, that we see that idea of triunity of God in Isaiah's prophecy. I'd like you to go back, please, to chapter 48. Uh, chapter 48, which I know you've already studied, but it might have been a while ago. You might have forgotten. And it says in verse 16, Come you near unto me, hear ye this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was. There am I. And now the Lord God and his spirit hath sent me. So again, we've got three distinct persons. One who is being sent. There am I. And then the Lord God and his spirit hath sent me. So again, we see the Lord Jesus in that capacity as the one who God has sent into this world. And then let's look at a New Testament corroboration of this idea of three distinct persons accomplishing the purposes of God in perfect unity, perfect harmony, different roles, but nevertheless uh, working together to accomplish the redemptive purposes of God on this earth. And that's in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, where we read this in Peter's marvelous sermon. He says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. There we go. Spirit of the Lord has anointed me. God has anointed me, how God anointed Jesus Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So we've got God anointing Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit, who went about doing good, and he's the anointed one. So again, we have this triunity idea, uh, three distinct persons, one God working together in perfect harmony for redemptive purposes. And so the spirit of the Lord came upon the Lord Jesus. Now, I want to think about this idea of anointing, because in the scriptures, as you well know, we have the anointing of the prophet, we have the anointing of the priest, and we have the anointing of the king, all three anointed. And of course, all three offices were found in the person of the Lord Jesus. He is God's prophet. He is the one that Moses spoke about in Deuteronomy 18, that God will raise up a prophet unto you, like unto me from your brethren. Uh, him shall you hear. Whoever doesn't hear him, <laughs> serious consequences for the one who doesn't listen to him. Uh, so he's God's prophet. He's also God's priest. The whole epistle to the Hebrews is designed to show that we have a perfect high priest in the Lord Jesus. He's the anointed high priest. And then, of course, he's God's king, God's Messiah who will come and rule and reign 
in this millennial age, the one when the glory of the Lord comes to the nation of Israel, it will be in the person of the Lord Jesus. His glory will be seen. And so uh, it's the idea that, uh, of course, in the Old Testament was that all of these individuals required the aid of the Spirit of God to function for God. The Old Testament priest couldn't do it in his own strength. He needed, the picture was that he needed the help of the Spirit of God to do his work as a suitable priest for God. The prophet, again, he's not given his own ideas. It's the Spirit of God that's come upon him that enables him to speak and be a spokesman for God. And then, of course, the kings. We saw David was anointed with oil. Prior to that, Saul was anointed, that anointing of the kings, showing that they needed the Spirit of God's enablement to be effective in their role that God has set out for them. And, of course, uh, we think of the Lord Jesus, that he came here as the... Although he was God, we, we believe that 100% God manifest in flesh, but he came as the second man, the last Adam, and he came as the dependent man, and he lived his life in dependence upon the Spirit of God. And another one of the servant songs of Isaiah highlights that, Isaiah 42, 1, where it says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment or justice to the Gentiles, so on and so forth. Again, speaking, God's perfect servant. And so, again, he's the anointed one. And he's the one that is come to bring blessing to a troubled world. He, he's come uh, to the, the brokenhearted. Uh, this this world is full of broken-hearted people, and he has come to, to bring healing to the broken-hearted, to bring liberty to those that are captives, captives to their own lusts and sins. This is what he came to, uh, to do. And Luke 4, that very passage that I asked you to keep a marker in, uh, it highlights uh, how he, his ministry was done in the full and complete dependence upon the Spirit of God. In the power of the Holy Spirit, he came and did these things. So just notice with me quickly, turn back to Luke 4, and I want you to notice that the that this, if ever there was a Spirit-filled chapter, this is it. And it's speaking of the ministry of the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So notice so far, Speaking of the Lord Jesus, he was full of the Holy Spirit, and he was led by the Holy Spirit. Then verse 14, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. And so he comes back from the wilderness temptation, and he comes in the power of the Spirit. Then he goes to the synagogue at Nazareth, and as we read earlier, verse 18, he reads this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to heal the broken hide, to preach the deliverance of the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty those that are bruised. And so quite clearly, the Lord Jesus fulfills this in his ministry, coming uh, to set men free, men who were bound by sin, men who were broken hearted because of sin. He came and he brought deliverance and liberty wherever he went now again uh, we we mentioned that he, he's going to preach the acceptable year of the lord when all this is going to happen this idea of liberty to the captives all the rest of it and i mentioned to you that really the background is found in the book of leviticus chapter 25 and what we call the year of jubilee and I want you just to turn there uh, just to see this. Now, if we had more time to develop this, we could read the whole section. And I'll give you that section if you want to read it in your own time. It's from verse 8 down to verse 16 of Leviticus chapter 25. But we're going to just read, uh, break in and read verse 9 and 10. It says, Then shalt thou cause, uh, this is Leviticus 25 verse 9, Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, in the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land, and you shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof 
it shall be a jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man to his possession, and you shall return every man to his family. And so it was a, a marvelous time when things were put right after, after 50 long years, things are put right. A brother who had been sold, sold his possessions because he got into difficulty could repossess it. Or a poor brother who had been sold into bondage could well be released and set free. And it was a wonderful provision. Tragically, I mean, again, I won't take the time to look there, but you might want to read it. In Jeremiah 34, verses 8 through 20, this was commanded to be done. And they actually did it. And then after they had released the captives, when it was over kind of thing and nobody was kind of looking, uh, the prophet had done his thing and said his piece. They went back and they took them captive again and they basically overturned it. Uh, but it's a lovely picture of deliverance from sin, setting the captives free. And that's why the Lord Jesus came to proclaim the acceptable the year of the Lord. He came in those three offices, prophet, priest, and king, a prophet, uh, spokesman to God, to, spreet, to preach good tidings to the meek. As prophet, he is preaching this good tidings, this glorious message to the meek, to those that are uh, not haughty, but are willing to receive with meekness the engrafted word, to preach good tidings to the meek. As a priest, he came to bind up the brokenhearted and as a king, kings had the right to proclaim liberty uh, to the captives. And so he comes to fulfill these glorious ministries. And in Luke's gospel, that passage in chapter four, he did those very things. If you notice at the end of the chapter, uh, down in verse 40, we get an illustration of him doing this, setting the captives free. Uh, tremendous ministry of the Lord Jesus. Now, when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with diverse diseases brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And devils also came out of many, people who were bound by Satan, by, by his emissaries, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew, not, knew that he was Christ. And so we see the Lord Jesus doing those very things. And then, of course, his preaching, verse 43, he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to others also, for therefore am I sent. And of course, I want to emphasize this, that he's the one that God sent. We see it again in verse one. Uh, he talks about the spirit of the Lord. God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. In a sense, revealing the heart of God. God's heart is for the broken heart. And the Lord Jesus was sent to them uh, to accomplish all of these things. Now, I want you to go back with me now to Isaiah 61 and verse 2. And notice it says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's that year of jubilee. Uh, this year that captives can be delivered. But then he, it tells us uh, in our passage in Luke 4 that once he had read to that point, it says he closed the book, he sat down, and he said, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. But he, he stopped re reading right at the acceptable year of the Lord. And he, and he didn't continue. If it had continued, it says, in the day of vengeance of our God. But that day of vengeance has been put on hold. That's why he didn't read it. It's not being fulfilled, but it's coming. The day of the vengeance of our God is coming on planet Earth. And it, it will come uh, when um, the Lord Jesus comes the second time. As we said, not in grace, but in glory. And he will come to execute judgment and vengeance. And I want you to notice, just look in Isaiah 63, just a couple of pages over, we get a description of it. Here, he says in 63 and verse 3, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment, for the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed 
is come. And so it's really looking to that time, at the end of the tribulation period, when the Lord Jesus comes and he's going to come and he will bring deliverance to those that mourn. And he will also bring vengeance on those that are in opposition to him and in rebellion to him. And so we get the two advents of the Lord Jesus here. And again, a New Testament reference that might have relevance to us in the tiny little epistle of Jude just before the book of Revelation. I want you to look at Jude 15. And uh, this is one of the earliest prophecies we know of given by Enoch, the seventh from Adam. And notice verse 14, Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. It's the Lord coming back with ten thousands of his saints. He's coming out of heaven. He's coming with that redeemed company that are going to come with him. That would be us, folks. We're coming riding on white horses with the Lord uh, uh, from heaven. It says, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And so that day is coming, that day of vengeance, when the Lord will come and execute vengeance on those uh, that are described so aptly there in Jude and verse 15, the ungodly, uh, the ones who said, we don't want God in our equation. We don't want him in our life. Uh, they, they make ungodly speeches against him. They love to deride uh, his claims. And uh, of course, our universities and uh, even our places of power are filled with people like this who every single day love to deride the Lord Jesus. But the day of reckoning is coming. The day of vengeance will come. And of course, it's important to distinguish between revenge, which implies a malicious, spiteful response to injury or wrong, and vengeance, which implies just recompense, the day of vengeance of our God. Because when he comes and does these things, it will be an absolute righteousness. Uh, he's going to deal in ab absolute righteousness. People will acknowledge that he's right in doing what he is doing. Revelation 19, verse 11, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, he that is upon him, sat upon him, was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. So he, he says, he's coming to uh, proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, that was the first advent, the day of vengeance of our God, that's not fulfilled yet, but will yet be fulfilled at his second advent to the earth. But at the same time, as executing venge vengeance, he says he's also going to comfort all that mourn. Comfort all that mourn. And so who are the mourners? Who are those that are going to be mourning at that time? <clears throat> Notice, please. The previous chapter, chapter 60 and verse 20, it says, The sun shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself, for the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, speaking of Israel, and the days of thy mourning shall be ended. So it'll be the people of Israel who are going to be mourning. But why are they going to be mourning? I want you to look at Zechariah, please. The prophecy of Zechariah chapter 12 and he's going to bring comfort to those that mourn Zechariah 12 very familiar I'm sure to all of us amazing verse it says in verse 10 speaking of the tribulation and it says in verse 9 come to pass in that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem so it's that time when Jerusalem are, are surrounded by armies they're going to wipe them off the face of the earth the final solution as far as they're concerned is in grasp we've got the Jews surrounded they're all in one place we've allowed them to go back to the land we're going to wipe them out and then it says at that time I will pour upon the house of David on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications, 
So the Holy Spirit is going to do something marvelous to this remnant that are left, that are surrounded by their enemies. He's going to be working powerfully. And one of the things you're going to be doing is there's going to be a spirit of grace and supplication, undeserved favor. They deserve to be wiped out because of all that they've done. But it's, it's grace that's at work here. And then supplication. They're going to cry out to God in prayer. They're going to be praying, save now, save now, Hosanna, looking for him that comes in the name of the Lord. And so as they're praying, it says the one that they're praying to, they don't realize it, but it says they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And so when they're delivered, they look on him, the deliverer, the last one they expect, the one they've constituted to be the apostate, they've despised him, despised, rejected of men. And yet here he is, the very one that they crucified is coming to save them. And it says they'll mourn and there'll be genuine repentance. It'll affect the whole of the nation that's left at that time. Two thirds are already wiped out. That third that are left, there's going to be great mourning. And then verse chapter 13, verse 1, in that day there'll be a fountain open for the house of David, for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and uncleanness. And so he's going to come and comfort all them that mourn. The very one that they have been so bad to throughout their history, despised him, rejected him, he's going to come and deliver them. Just like the story of Joseph. Do you remember Joseph's brethren? They were petrified. And he came to do them good, right? To save life. And that's what's going to be like with the Lord. When he's revealed in glory to his brethren the second time, they'll be petrified, but he'll deal with them, those that mourn, with comfort. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. This is all verse three, that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Just delightful verses. What the Lord is going to do for that nation uh, upon his return, he's going to give them beauty for ashes. Now, again, this relates to a future day, the coming uh, day when the Lord returns for his nation, his people Israel. But, but we can see lots of application, can't we? Because how many of us, our lives were ash heap lives because of sin. And the Lord Jesus came and in his mercy and his grace, he took our mourning, our brokenness, and he turned our ash heap lives into something beautiful. And so he's already doing it in a measure now uh, to, the, to those that believe on him. But he's going to do it to the whole nation in that day, making beauty for ashes. Uh, what an encouraging message to the Lord's people at any time. But what a wonderful way he's going to take away all of their disappointments, all the, the, the ash heaps of their lives and make it, them into something very beautiful. The oil of joy, of course, the oil, as we've seen already, symbolic of the spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to bring deep joy. Uh, to these people. The fruit of the Spirit, we uh, can say it ourselves, is joy, and it's going to be seen in them. And I want you to look back at Ecclesiastes to see how anointing with oil was always shown as a symbol uh, of joy in people's lives. It, it was a, a joyful, uh, kind of connected always uh, with this idea of joy. So if you look at Ecclesiastes 9, and verses 7 and 8, Ecclesiastes 9. Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart. For God now accepteth thy works. Let thy garments be always white, and let thy head lack no ointment. And so usually connected with joy. Uh, and so uh, the Lord is uh, going to bring to the nation that have had tremendous sorrows as a people. Their history is... Well, it's a, it's a mourning history, isn't it? It's a terrible history, but it's going to be turned into deep joy. 
And so this is what God will do for this nation, the oil of joy for mourning, the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. This nation will finally glorify the Lord. People that he has planted, trees that will bring forth fruit for him, finally, uh, they will be a fruitful people. And it says they shall build the old ways. Verse 4, they shall raise up the former desolations and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And as you think of their nation, uh, there's, uh, they've been constantly over the centuries, uh, the scene of many a, uh, an invasion, many of a battle. There's a lot of ruins throughout the land. And basically, uh, there's yet an even greater uh, ruination coming during the tribulation period where there'll be much devastation in the land but he says that he is going to allow them to build up the old ways they'll raise up the former desolations they'll repair the waste cities the desolations of many generations and so the land will be rebuilt reconstituted uh, and it's going to be a marvelous time look back at chapter 58 please verse 12 it says, and they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. They shall raise up the foundation of many generations. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. And so in a very literal sense, but also in a spiritual sense, there's going to be foundations that have been undermined through uh, liberalism, through the uh, the godless philosophies of this world, foundations that have been destroyed are going to be rebuilt again. Uh, breaches are going to be repaired. There's going to be restoration. And it's not going to be just the Israel Israelis that are going to be doing this because it tells in verse 5 they're going to get help from those that have persecuted them in the past. We've already seen that in the previous chapter. But notice again in verse 5, strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. And the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. Not in a negative sense, but they're going to be like your servants. Uh, and uh, they're going to minister to them. And it tells in verse 6, you shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. And in their glory, you shall boast yourselves. We saw a little bit of that in the previous chapter, chapter 60 and verse 10 where it says the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls, their king shall minister to thee, for in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor have I had mercy on thee. So Gentile nations will really help to rebuild the desolation of the land of Israel. And they will, they will come and serve them. And it, it's not going to be unwilling. They'll do it in a very willing way, not slave labor, but willingly serve them because they will be acknowledged uh, and exalted as the priests of God and as the ministers of God. They'll recognize their priestly role. Back in the book of Exodus, in chapter 19, Exodus 19 and verse 6, this was God's original plan for the nation where he says in verse 6 of Exodus 19, you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak to the children of Israel. But you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And God's word will be fulfilled. And this is the fulfillment of it. In the millennial kingdom, they will be the, a, a nation who will be a kingdom of priests. And the Gentiles will acknowledge their priestly role. Uh, you shall be named the priest of the Lord. You'll be called ministers of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. And the idea is this, that uh, just as the priests of the Old Testament were to be supported by the people, so these priestly nation, the nation of Israel, the nation of priests, they will also eat the riches of the Gentiles. They'll support them in their labors. They'll recognize that these people have a nearness to God. They'll come to, we, we see it in Zechariah, they'll come to the Jew and grab hold of his skirt and say, tell me about your God. They'll have that priestly role. And we observed in the previous chapter, chapter 60 and verse 16, 
Thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles and shalt suck the breast of kings. And thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am thy savior and thy redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. And of course, one of the evidences that, that the Lord Jesus is truly their redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob, is they'll see these very things fulfilled. Gentile nations supporting them. Now we get a hint of that uh, in the book of Romans. I want to look at Romans chapter 15 in verse 27. Romans 15 verse 27, it says, It has pleased them verily, and their debtors they are, for if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. And so in the coming day, the Gentile nations will recognize the great debt they owe to the nation of Israel. I hope we recognize that in a measure today. The Bible that we're speaking from was written largely by Jewish men, with the exception of Luke. Uh, it was written by Jewish people. It was preserved by them. It was copied by them. It was kept by them. And not only do we owe our scriptures to them, which have been such a blessing to us, our Savior was a Jew. And so we, we're so blessed. The blessing that the Jewish people have brought to us is unmeasurable. And in the coming day, the whole world will recognize the blessing that has come to them through that nation. Notice verse 7. It says, for your shame, you shall have double. And for confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. And so, you know, the firstborn was to get a double portion. And back in Exodus 4.22, it says, Israel, my firstborn. And they will indeed get a double portion. Now, interestingly enough, they've already had a double portion of judgment for their sins. If you look back to Isaiah 40, In verse 1, it says, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. Cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So over the centuries, she has received double for her sins. But in the day of her restoration, she will receive double. She'll receive a double portion of blessing. And so it says, in your shame, you shall have double for confusion. They shall re rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess the double everlasting joy shall be unto them. And of course, that principle of sowing and reaping, isn't it? We not only reap what we sow, but we also reap more than we sow. So they, in their sin, they received, received a double portion. But when they're restored, they'll receive. A double portion because it says i the lord love judgment or justice i hate robbery for burnt offerings i will direct their work in truth i will make an everlasting covenant with them and of course it's speaking of the new covenant that the lord will make with the house of israel and if you remember the story of job do you remember when, when god restored the captivity of job when he prayed for his friends it says the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. And this nation, in their coming day of blessing, will receive far more than they've ever had before. <coughs> Excuse me. And so she'll be acknowledged and known and loved by all. It says their, se their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, their offspring among the people, all that see them shall acknowledge them, that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. There'll be a common consensus of those nations that are in the tribulation, that come through the tribulation, should I say, go into the millennial kingdom. Those nations will all acknowledge that Israel are the seed which the Lord has blessed. They will acknowledge their new place. And then it talks about the rejoicing of this remnant that are now restored and now in this place of blessing it says i will rejoice i greatly rejoice in the lord 
My soul shall, soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with a robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. And so it's speaking of the fact that this nation, uh, once despised, once hated, well, they're going to be clothed instead of rags and poverty. They're going to be clothed with the garments of salvation. It's going to be covered in robe of righteousness. His righteousness, Jehovah said, can you, the Lord, our righteousness will be their righteousness in that day. They will indeed be a righteous nation and a fruitful nation, just as the Lord brings forth her bud. Verse 11, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. So this will be a, a time of great exaltation of the nation. Now, as we bring these thoughts to a close from this chapter, I want to just go one step for, further in the anointing. And I, I don't know if I mentioned this last week or not. Forgive me. Uh, at my age, I forget things easily. But um, in the Bible, there are four distinct groups that are anointed. We've already talked about prophets and priests and kings. And of course, they're all typical of the Messiah who will be God's anointed prophet, priest, and king. The Lord Jesus, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me. But there's a fourth group that were anointed and that was the lepers who were cleansed and they were anointed with oil. And it's a beautiful picture, really, of the new birth, because they're, all their hair is shaved off, including their eyebrows and everything, and they just look like a new baby. Uh, they've been, as it were, leprosy is a picture of sin. They've been crippled by sin, marred by sin, and now they're just like new babes again. And they're anointed. The Spirit of God comes upon them, and they're now... Uh, they're, they're transformed. They're, they're transformed people and they've gone go and testify to what the Lord has done for them. And I want to suggest to you that in a sense, it's a picture of us because we, leprosy of sin, had wrecked and ruined our lives. But the Lord has saved us. Of course, that story of the leper, there's these two birds. Remember the one that is killed and its blood is put on the other one and the other one flies away. And, of course, it's a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And as a result of that, we've been cleansed. And we have re received the Spirit of God. And we're now, the New Testament calls us the anointed of the Lord. And so, in a very real sense, our role right now in the absence of the Master is to recognize our place. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon us. And he has anointed us. And what are we supposed to do? Preach good tidings to those that are meek. We're to preach the good news. And we've been empowered by the Spirit to preach the good news. He's cleansed us. He's filled us with his Spirit. And he sent us out. And he's told us to preach liberty to those that are captive. And isn't it wonderful that we can preach that we have a message that can set the captive free? It doesn't matter how much bondage they're in. You shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. And there's nothing that sets men free more than the glorious gospel of our blessed Savior, the Lord Jesus. The one who came to die and shed his precious blood and rose again victoriously so that rebels and sinners might be given a new beginning, a new start, might be new babes and might have a whole new future of joy and rejoicing to exchange ash heap lives and make them into something beautiful. That's what the gospel does. So let's be good ambassadors of the Lord Jesus. And yet we recognize that all blessing that will come to this planet ultimately are going to come from the one whom he has sent, our beloved, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful. For this portion, we pray that it might have been a blessing to our hearts as we consider the one who you sent, the one who you anointed, the one who could say and alone could say, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your hearing. And Father, we're thankful for the glorious future that's up ahead for the people of Israel. And yet we're mindful of vengeance that will come upon the ungodly. 
And yet, Lord, we're still living in that acceptable year of the Lord. We're still living in that day where captives can go free. And we have a responsibility to proclaim the Jubilee message to our lost and dying world. Thank you that you've given us the power to do it, the message to do it. And we pray that we'll be obedient to these things in the name of the Lord Jesus for his glory. Amen. Amen.